So welcome to today. Uh, the workshop is about games and role play. It's one of our Beyond Books and Manual series. My name is Siri. I'm the coordinator for the Open Library here at eCampus Ontario. I'm also joined by my colleague Ritima, who is uh, the person in charge of our integrating OER program, and she will also be helping moderate chat. We're also joined by the team behind My Watershed today, um, Isabel Barrett-Ing and Mark Lubrick, who will be walking us through their OER later on today. Very exciting. But before we get to that, there's a few things we have to run through. Um, and the first of that is we do want to ground today's session in a land acknowledgement. So the offices of eCampus Ontario, located in downtown Toronto, are within the traditional territories of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. We acknowledge and we thank the diverse Indigenous peoples whose footsteps have, currently do, and will continue to mark this territory. And we also ask that you consider the caretakers of the lands and the waters on which you are situated. So I'm coming to you as a settler here on land covered by Treaty 13 and the William Treaties, where I have the honour to work and play. Please feel free to share your own land acknowledgements in the chat. So if you've come to any of these sessions before, any of the other open library sessions, um, you're probably very familiar with the sort of very quick rapid fire list of things at eCampus that I tend to deliver. Uh, I'm not necessarily gonna go through all of that today in part because it exists in so many different workshops and also it tends to leave me out of breath and I wanna get to the interesting parts of the workshop today, which don't involve me talking if I'm being honest, but very, very, very briefly, um, in even shorter order than I usually do. Uh, eCampus Ontario leads a consortium of the province's universities, colleges, and indig Indigenous institutes. We're here to su help support our member institutions when it comes to innovation and collaboration. We've got a lot of things to accomplish that. A few key things to note coming down the pipeline. We've got the micro-credential forum coming up next week, March 1 through 3. Uh, it's not too late to register. I will make a very terrible joke here and say it is, in fact, a big deal rather than a micro one. Um, it's a terrible joke. Don't laugh. I, you don't have to. I won't go into comedy. Don't worry. Um, but if you're interested also in adaptive learning, please check out the Personalizing Education at Scale series of workshops from our folks at Adaptive Learning here at eCampus. There's actually one this afternoon at 2 p.m. about using AI to build retention for learning with some of the folks from Georgian College talking about their integration of Sarago into their communications course. So links for both of those have been dropped in chat by Ritima. Feel free to check them out. With all that said, tiny things about the open library before I pass the proverbial microphone off to the team that's here with us today. So there are a handful of ways to search and find games or role play or serious games in the open library. The easiest of this is honestly just searching games. Um, a link for that direct search is actually in the chat right now, dropped by Ritima. This will at least maybe get you started on what's on offer. Another thing to consider is broadening out your scope and looking at item types. So a tiny reminder, you can filter the open library. When you go through our search, you can scroll down. On the left-hand side, you will have filters. And from there, you can expand item types, Feel free to select interactive activities if that's something that you want to start with. This tends to be where the bulk of interactive activities live. Um, that being said, you still might not end up with all of, let's say, the instructor's guides on how to add game-based learning into your teaching, but it is a place to start. You can always reach out to us at open at ecampsontario.ca if you have any questions or are running into some issues finding what you're looking for. And also, given that we're here chatting about OER, so open education resources, Consider making your own or adapting course content that is licensed for derivative use into a game that suits your curriculum. You can take inspiration from what you see in our collection or from what you're going to see here today and adapt it for your own needs. There are, of course, multiple ways into that, as well as some resources on adding game-based learning into your teaching currently in the open library. And with all that said, I mean, there are a few places that you can start for help. Um, the biggest one, obviously, you can contact, contact us again open at ecampusontario.ca. We also have the OOLN, which is the Ontario Open Library Network. It's a Slack channel where you can ask questions with other folks who are involved in open education in Ontario and also around the world. We do also want to recommend that you contact your library and your librarians. They are incredible resources and they will probably know far more about the collections available to you at your institution than I can currently yet at the moment. Um, I'm not an expert in every institution that is amongst our members. I wish I was, but I'm not that great. Um, and then finally, also look at your teaching and learning center. This is going to have a different name and probably a different specialty depending on your institution, but it's a great resource. They have experts, they have instructional designers, they have 
you know, wonderful, wonderful people who are very likely going to be able to help you in a very detailed way to adapt things for your course. So all of that said, that's my spiel done. Um, I do want to pass things off to Isabel and Mark, who are here to talk to us about My Watershed, which is, uh, I believe, the full title, A Sandbox Game for Connecting and Accelerating Sustainability Stewards of the Future. Um, short form, I believe, just My Watershed probably works. Um, but I will pass it off to Isabel and Mark, who are going to walk us through their OER. So I'm going to stop sharing. And I leave it to Isabel and Mark. Great. Thank you so much. I'm just going to share my screen here. Great. Um, thanks so much, everyone, for coming and for giving us the privilege of sharing um, of sharing your time with us today. We're excited to be here and to share a little bit with you about a project that we did uh, using eCampus Ontario funding. Um, and what we did is build a game called My Watershed. Um, I'm going to just start with introductions. Um, so my name is Isabel Bretting. I'm a professor and head of integrative biology here at the University of Windsor. Mark? Uh, I'm Mark Lubert from the Office of Open Learning. Uh, I also get to teach in science. And we are definitely um, a small portion of a big team, as you can see on that slide, who worked together for about a year to come up with the My Watershed game. So we are really fortunate to have built a strong collaboration with Adam Clare, who unfortunately couldn't be here. He's at Sheridan College. Um, he's a professor of game design and a number of students in the game design program who worked carefully with us uh, on a weekly basis for about a year as we built the My Watershed game. We also have a number of other faculty members here at the University of Windsor um, that collaborated with us uh, to basically make this game as realistic as we can um, in terms of use, making use of real data, um, really integrating aspects of watersheds as realistically as we could to give a really amazing experience to our game players. So we wanted to highlight that before starting because definitely this is a huge team effort and Mark and I are here to represent the team today. So the biggest challenge that we wanted to solve in building the My Watershed game is that traditional classrooms offer fairly limited opportunities to plan and implement restoration due to barriers of ecological, spatial, and temporal scale. So essentially students really have um, a lot of challenges in terms of understanding if they implement a certain restoration strategy at a certain location, what the effects of that restoration strategy are going to be in a couple of months, let alone a couple of years. It's really hard for them to understand what those effects could be and what types of change they're affecting in trying to implement these different restoration strategies. So we were wanting to see how could we create a simulation that was as realistic as possible that would allow students to better understand the effects of restoration strategies by speeding time up a little bit. So you'll see in our game that we've been able to speed up time um, in taking 50 years and actually speed it down to 50 minutes. So we're going to show you um, a small overview of what the game looks like, but also give you an um, a chance to understand what their process was in building the game and how we assembled our multidisciplinary and multi-institution team in order to build the My Watershed game. So what you're seeing here is a small um, snapshot of what the My Watershed game looks like. So this is a game that you can find at mywatershed.ca and it's playable directly from that particular website. So we had a number of goals in terms of uh, building the particular My Watershed game. And the main one was really focused on training and empowering youth to take on the challenge of ecological restoration and also reconnect with nature in a transformational way. So we were really focused on that goal as we created the My Watershed Sandbox game. What's really cool about the My Watershed uh, Sandbox game is it actually utilizes a digital twin of the Humber River watershed. And it provides our learners with the opportunity to engage actively in restoration 
using a real world endangered species, which is the red side dace. And I'll speak to the red side dace um, in a few short moments. Uh, this particular game has been designed specifically for undergraduate students who would be in their first or second year of study in a biological sciences program or environmental sciences program. Mark, did you wanna add anything? Yes, I just want to mention I did drop the link to the website in the chat. I also dropped the link to the open library repository and the original GitHub link we were using. Um, we are showing you this little teaser trailer of what the game looks like in the hope of that you try it. Also in the hope that some people will find this useful enough that you can take it and maybe modify it to your own needs. Because all the code is provided, you can use it. You're going to see it's built in Unity. So you can take this, modify it to suit your needs. If we update it, we're hoping to update the links in the open library, of course, but I also want to put the GitHub just in case that gets updated first. But I'll pass it back to Isabel. Thanks, Mark. So I wanted to share with you a little bit about the Red Side Day. So you see a photo here. Um, we are excited to be able to work with uh, Dr. Trevor Pitcher here at the University of Windsor, who is, sorry, a Red Side Day expert. And Red Side Days are an endangered species of fish. Um, you can see Based on the photos, basically they've got a red stripe on the sides of their body, so that's where um, the name comes from. This is a really cool fish in that it, it actually will jump out of water to catch its prey. Um, so if you actually go on YouTube, um, Dr. Pitcher's uh, one of her one of his graduate students, her name is Ashley Watt, and was actually the first one to capture them jumping out of water to catch their prey, um, to catch insects. So if you go on YouTube, you can actually see videos of, of that particular species of fish doing that. So we wanted to pick something that was local. So we do find red side dace uh, living in the Humber River watershed. So we wanted to create a game that was as realistic as possible to really try to engage uh, players in becoming attached to the fate of the red side dace and to try to play the game to ensure that we can remedy their environment and ensure their survival. So essentially the game is based on the principle that we're trying to save the red side dace and um, its habitat. So if you are implementing ecological strategies in the Humber River watershed, that's, as, that's part of the My Watershed game, and you end up killing the red side dace, then essentially you've lost the game. So if you were really trying to uh, get our players excited about saving this type of fish and um, really starting to think about doing some, some hypothesis testing. So looking at you know, what types of restoration strategies they could implement and where they could implement them um, along that particular watershed. So we had a number of objectives, um, specific objectives, as we were working together as a team to design and implement the My Watershed game. Um, the first objective was really to try and replicate the Humber River watershed digitally, I can't say that today, um, as closely as possible, um, but also mirror uh, as realistically as possible the challenges that were facing the Red Side Days. So we wanted to create a realistic simulation where this, the interactions that our players were going to face were based on ecological principles and critical challenges that included the concept of spatial, temporal, and ecological scale, um, scale and restoration. What we wanted to do was to allow certain key elements of my watershed to be manipulated by players so that lessons on restoration ecology could be revealed through the realistic simulations. So we wanted this to be a way for students to um, come up with a hypothesis implement um, a, a restoration strategy, monitor the results, and actually look at what kinds of conclusions could they reach based on what they've done as part of the game. And the game has been designed in a way that it will give those players data that they can look at, that they can analyze, that they can think about, that they can share, that they can get feedback on um, to really um, support their learning in terms of the effects of those restoration strategies. And lastly, uh, la last but not least, we wanted to encourage play culture, um, but also in doing that, foster student ownership over the solutions that they are implementing. And we wanted to do that to allow students to evaluate options, receive feedback on their choices, but also encourage their inquiry um, in this particular simulated environment. Now, we're really proud of the approach that we took because this is, um, 
I have to honestly say one of the best teams I have ever worked with um, in terms of research that I've done um, over the course of my career. We came together as a multidisciplinary, multi-institution team. Um, and a lot of us had never met in person before. This was all through COVID. So we were meeting all virtually and we came together virtually to share and honor each other's uh, knowledge and expertise and really, um, really honor our, our different views and perspectives to create my watershed. So we had people on the team whose expertise was in game design, others were in restoration ecology, we had freshwater ecologists, we had um, members of our team who um, had Indigenous knowledges, we had members in our team uh, who were specialists in the scholarship of teaching and learning, we also had a member of our team who was an, um, an expert um, in AODA. So all of these people came together to create my watershed, um, as you can see it on the website. So I'm going to pass it back to Mark, who is going to uh, walk you through the different uh, steps that we took in order to build the, and design the My Watershed game. Yes, yeah, we had a very great team, as Isabel said. Uh, and initially, when we were looking at designing the game, we wanted some overarching principles to follow, some advice, some guidance. And some that we found useful were the digital education strategies and the simulation lifecycle from Dalhousie, uh, especially the idea of doing some initial planning. I mean, this was helpful even during the proposal stage thinking, well, what are we saying we're going to do? It helped guide that. And then even once we started designing the game, we stuck with that and it was quite useful. As Isabel said, one of the things we wanted to do was make this authentic. And we are fortunate here. We have a group called Glear, and they had a lot of data that we could use. So we had members of the team from that group, and we did pick one of the species at risk, the red side days. And as is both said, we wanted the students to really have some ownership to care about what they're doing. They're given the opportunity to try to actually see what strategies are going to work. And as was alluded to earlier, it's not exactly something you can normally do. You can't go out there and see, okay, one year to another, is not gonna be a good drastic change, but by model modeling that, we could let them actually have some ownership, try a solution, see if it helps, see if it hurts. And we, again, wanted to be authentic. So we were using those data sets, having access to actual data we could use and integrate into the game to make it authentic was key. Uh, when we first looked at building this, we did suggest we were going to use Unity, and then during the design phase, the first couple of weeks, we double-checked looking at what might be a good platform, and we stuck with Unity. We thought it had a lot of advantages, not least of which, again, is you can use it. Unity being open, we want you to have the chance to be able to take this game. And of course, hopefully some of you will just play it. Maybe some of you will like it. Some of you can just use it as is, but you're also very welcome to take it, modify it to suit your needs. And within Unity, it was nice that we could show that each area, each um, block interacted with its neighbors. When you're doing this kind of uh, restoration. It's not just, oh, I did something here and it has no impact everywhere else. No, it does impact the neighboring areas as well. So that was a nice authentic thing we could bring in as well. In terms of the next first steps, um, so on the next slide, we do talk about the fact that after figuring out the platform, we still didn't start building. It was a pretty long process of doing storyboarding. That was key. That is something that's uh, recommended in the simulation uh, guides I was talking about earlier. And Adam really led that charge. He used Miro, he found that useful. It was nice because you could write up storyboards and you could also share them pretty easily because it was a lot of revisions and he worked a lot with our content experts. We wanted to make sure that this was very authentic. I mean, again, building a resource that is fun, but not educational wasn't going to suit our needs. But he also really did help us realize that it had to have kind of a goal, a story, that idea of a 50 year time frame where you're trying to get these red side days to survive. And it helped us narrow the scope. The storyboarding, that was important. 
making sure is that we could have included a ton of different species. And we do talk about things like trout, but we wanted there to be a specific focus, a specific goal again, how does red side dace? And that is really a microcosm for the overall idea of trying to keep the ecosystem uh, surviving well. As Isabel alluded to, the students were absolutely amazing. Uh, it was a pleasure working with them. I was incredibly impressed because they really led the development. They were student designers at Sheridan that they did amazing work. Adam was there to help lead and guide, but the students really did a lot of the designing of the uh, graphics, designing of the game. They led the meetings that I'm going to allude to in a second, and they even led each other. There were pretty small groups. From one term to the other, we had maybe up to five, uh, as little as three, depending on the term. But even within the teams, there was more senior ones who'd kind of lead. They were often sharing files. Again, one might be working more on design, one more on the graphics. And so they worked a lot. One would try to build something. They'd incorporate it, see if it worked. And it was a pleasure to watch. In regards to those weekly meetings, uh, we started those pretty early on, not initially. Uh, at first, again, we had storyboarding. And in the first like month or two of the design, it was more getting the basic build up. But very quickly, we started having weekly meetings. And as Isabel said, those are online, which is interesting because some of us never actually met each other. But it actually worked in some ways better. It was easier. I mean, from a large group of us able to coordinate you know, from many locations, we had, again, program developers, we had the media developers, people who were doing the graphics, we had content experts, and we could have content experts come in to weekly meetings as needed. We also had accessibility experts. So throughout, there was people there to give feedback on these designs, because we could see Online meeting meant we could share our screens very easily. The students would share their screens, show us the current build, show us the current graphics, and could get immediate feedback as they were designing. Things like, oh, okay, wait, you shouldn't be just using color to identify something. Quick, easy resolution. And it was, again, very impressive to watch, especially some of the times when they forgot they were sharing their screens and immediately started fixing the thing that they were just told about it was pretty awesome because you'd see them fix it. And again, they were showing things in Unity so you could actually even try really early versions. And they did actually start showing it to friends and family as well, partly because they were proud of what they were building, also to get some early feedback. And we did do game testing, of course. Um, when we first started the game testing, we knew there was still the build wasn't quite right. But we wanted to get game testing. We got a variety of graduate, undergraduates. We tried to have diverse group looking at it. And again, it wasn't done yet, but getting people in and playing a version of the game meant we could still get some feedback and identify things that we maybe didn't realize, even if there was things we knew we'd have to fix as well. And at this point, I'm going to pass it back to Isabel. Great. Thanks, Mark. Um, so I wanted to share with you a little bit more in terms of how the Humber uh, river watershed was reconstructed. Um, so essentially how it was done is it consists in the game of a series Did we lose her? I think she might be frozen. Um, give her a second. She's a little more familiar with this, but um, you can see she's still here. And we haven't lost the slides, so that's a good sign. But in the meantime, I can try and jump in. Um, as we said, we're trying to re-simulate the Humber watershed. And you can see, as it says here, that there was a bunch of tiles. Each tile was supposed to be equal to 100 square meters. Oh. We just lost it, so bear with me as I pull this up on my screen, and she will hopefully come back in. So bear with me just a moment. Here we go. So we were, and hopefully you can see that now, as you might have seen in the initial GIF showing the gameplay, we did have different types of tiles, um, and including the land, 
and it really is trying to model the diverse landscape that is there in the Humber watershed. So we had water tiles, different nature. We had uh, land tiles of different types, both commercial and just vegetation. And different cards you may have seen would interact with different types of tiles. And might it was pretty quick, that initial gameplay demonstration, but you might have seen that when they were trying to drop it on land, the one card was red. Whereas in other areas, you had to drop it in the water because it depended on what that particular card was actually going to Probably not doing justice to this slide, but hopefully Isabel will be back in just a moment. I'm going to double check to see. There she is. Perfect. My apologies. Somehow I got <laughs> kicked out of the internet, so I apologize for that. Um, so can you still see my slide? Um, I started sharing, but oh, I will goodness. stop sharing and let you no take worries. back over. Oh, no worries. Sorry about that, everybody. Thanks for doing that, Mark. <laughs> no problem. And I was just describing how the, uh, that reconstruction of the Humber watershed was working, how there was different types perfect. of tiles. Great, perfect. Yeah, so so um, uh, so basically two, two main categories of tiles, uh, land tiles, water tiles, again, with the, the spirit of trying to keep it as authentic as we could moving forward uh, into the game design. So we... Um, I want to give you a bit of a snapshot of what it looks like when you're playing the game. Um, we gave you a little bit of a snapshot earlier on in our presentation today uh, with that video in terms of what it looks like when you're actually inside the game. Um, a couple of points that we wanted to emphasize um, in terms of the what you see going into the game. So I'm going to draw your attention to the bottom left hand side of the photo of the figure here, the screenshot of the game. Um, this is our fish camp. So you can actually see red site day swimming um, in the Humber River watershed as you're playing the game. And our amazing design students uh, were able to actually create it in such a way that depending on the ecological uh, restoration strategies that you're implementing, you can actually see the red side, um, the red bar on the side of the fish getting brighter and darker if you're putting in strategies that actually help the fish thrive. Um, so basically the redder the bar is, the healthier the fish are. So if, if it's going down, if it's, if it's not as red, that means that probably you're doing, um, you're implementing strategies that are not as optimal as they could be to um, support the, um, the fish in that particular habitat. So a um, couple more things you can see at the bottom right hand side of that screenshot. So that's an actual map of the uh, Humber River watershed. So you can you can actually travel through the map. You can uh, look at different aspects of the map. You can look at uh, different concentrations. You can look at um, insects, fish. You can look at um, where more water is, where uh, different uh, types of tiles are that are really um, easily navigated to um, by going to the map and clicking on different elements in the map. So what this particular game really allows our students to do is the freedom to explore. And we wanted to set it up in a way that they can manipulate this uh, watershed in a very realistic way um, so that they could assess different strategies. They could implement these different efforts under resource constraints. So very, again, a very much mirroring what you would see um, in a natural um, setting uh, under natural conditions. Um, but they could also solicit feedback. So they could say, you know, I really want to try implementing this particular restoration strategy at a certain location of their choice and see what happens. What is going to happen to the environment? Is the red side days going to um, be supported or not, um, depending on what it is that they're selecting? So what we're really aiming to do as part of the My Watershed game is have players make both macro and micro impact based decisions that either hurt or help the watershed and the red side base thrive. So in terms of how the game starts, at the start of the game, you're going to see here in this particular screenshot that players are presented with three randomly selected cards and um, they basically have to pick one of them. 
So each card has a different restoration strategy uh, that can be applied to a player selected section of the watershed. Um, on the back of each card, the player can obtain more information about that particular strategy, um, but also things like the length of time that it would typically take um, to see any effects by implementing that particular strategy. So once the player selects a location, they can implement the strategy, they can also allocate resources to that particular strategy and start monitoring the effects of the implementation of that strategy at that particular location that they have selected. Um, and in also into, um, so that we can gamify it a little bit. So you can see that the titles of those cards are fun. So we were trying to really get our, our players in, involved and engaged in the game as they were thinking about different restoration strategies that they might be interested in exploring. Mark, anything to add? Oh, just a reminder that you can play the game on the site and there is a video that is has a tutorial. So if you aren't quite sure how to play it, you can watch that. It walks you through what everything is. Absolutely. Thanks, Mark. Um, so I want I, I would feel remiss without walking you through some of the data that you can actually collect as you're playing the game. And the reason that we wanted to do this is that this was actually some of our students' ideas um, from Sheridan. They got really excited about um, monitoring, but also displaying uh, data that is, is collected throughout the game to our students. And they've come up with different graphs that you can download. You can actually either take a screenshot or download at the end of the game as you're playing the game and trying to understand what's happening. So um, one of the different types of parameters that are collected are called uh, biotic parameters. So biotic means living. Um, so here what you're seeing is different bar graphs that allow you to measure um, number of red side dace in a certain location, uh, creek chub, but also brown trout, which would also be found in the Humber River watershed. Uh, we also are reporting on insect population, the riparian level, and the riverbed health. So again, these numbers are all based on data that were provided by our content experts. So again, trying to mirror as closely as possible what you would find in the Humber River watershed if you were to actually go out and implement the different restoration strategies um, in real life. So, um, so those are the biotic ones. We also have abiotic, abiotic means not living. Um, so here we're looking at um, uh, some data on the natural reservoir. So we're looking at pollution level, um, rate of flow of the water, sewage level, uh, sinuosity, uh, shade coverage, turbidity, water depth, and temperature. So again, so, some of the different parameters that um, can be uh, recorded, you can collect it throughout the game and really help in terms of analyzing your data. And so looking at, okay, I've tried this particular strategy, I had a hypothesis, what can I conclude based on the, the data that have been collected? One of the um, pieces that I want to emphasize here is that, again, trying to mirror as realistically as possible conditions, we do have a global temperature increase um, throughout the game. So this is something that players can't uh, prevent from happening. So basically we're all seeing the global temperature slowly increase over time with climate change. And this is also what is happening in the game. So over time, the temperature will rise. One last element that I want to draw your attention to is right on top of that map at the bottom right hand side of our figure, you can see a little uh, person, um, you can see a little hard hat there. So those are the um, basically uh, showcasing the number of volunteers that you have assigned to help you implement the different strategies that you've implemented at different locations of the watershed. I'll pass it back to Mark. Yeah, and a lot of this we've already talked about. Um, we did want this ideally designed to be playable within about 40 to 60 minutes. And that was something discussed even early on because we realized, well, again, in terms of scope, this could creep very large, but also we wanted it to be playable, say within a lab scenario or within a classroom scenario. So keeping the time frame a little more limited so that it would fit within a classic time for a class was important to us. And as alluded to, it's basically accelerating 50 years into about 50 minutes so that you can see what things I'm doing, how they actually end up uh, influencing the environment. And one thing you may have noticed when we were playing that initial GIF showing the gameplay is that there's a three-digit code 
that relates to which version you're playing. They're all very, very similar. It's just that the different parameters on the tiles. That way it is replayable. Different students could have different versions, try different things, and maybe even get slightly different results. You can pick the version you want. Of course, most people won't know what version they're gonna play, but you, if you want to replay one, you could, or just do a random one. So there is a replayability to the game as well. And speaking about the game, on the next slide, we've got uh, the link to a site again. I did share that in the chat earlier. And I do want to note that please try it. Have fun. There is that video that I was alluding to that walks you through it. It's about almost seven minutes long, and it goes into detail exactly how to play the game. And there's also a few other resources. Uh, along the top, you might see that there's the play educators. So over time, we're hoping to add more resources for educators who want to use this game. Of course, if you're using it and have things you want to share with us, great. We would love that. Um, the development process we talked about as well in there and more information about the Red Side Days. Uh, I will note that there was a couple videos I noticed today that I think we have to update the links for, but we will be adding more information about Red Side Days and again, things for educators over time. And back to Isabel. Thanks, Mark. Um, we want to invite you as well, if you're interested in helping us assess the effects of My Watershed on learning or incorporating the game in your course, please let us know. We would love to work with you on that. Um, this is something that we're focused on over the next year in terms of really trying to understand, um, you know, how this has helped support learning in game players of the My Watershed uh, game that we've, uh, we've come up with. So, our next steps, uh, we've got two uh, on the go. So we're working on creating partnerships with Indigenous knowledge keepers. And our hope is to actually introduce Indigenous knowledges that relate to the Humber River watershed, um, more specifically in the game. And we're also engaging in broader testing of our game um, through integration in uh, both first and second year undergrad courses in biology, ecology, and environmental sciences. So before we move on to the Q&A portion of today's time, we really wanted to acknowledge um, eCampus Ontario um, and the Government of Ontario for funding um, the virtual learning strategy. So this game definitely would not have been possible without that. So we really are uh, wanting to thank you for, um, for uh, believing in your project and supporting it. This was an amazing opportunity to work with a really amazing group of people um, over the last uh, year or so. So thank you so much for your time today. Uh, we know everyone's busy and we really uh, feel quite privileged that you've shared some of your time with us today. And Mark and I would be happy to answer any questions that you may have about the game. So thank you so much for, for walking us through your game. Um, I'm going to stop the recording now. So just if someone is watching this after the fact, there was a Q&A period, um, but we have opted not to record it.